Hello and welcome to our couch lesson number 16. I'm very happy to see you all and I hope that you will spend a pleasant hour with us, maybe sitting on a couch, maybe with a cold drink in your hand. And I also hope that you enjoyed the music. It was the song Smile written and performed by Yona. And Yona is a virtual person driven by artificial intelligence and digital technologies made by Ash Kusha and Isabella Wintrop. Ash Kusha was one of the experts we invited to our couch lesson about AI and music three weeks ago. And today we want to speak about a way more serious topic about AI and democracy. Democracy is one of humanity's most important achievements, but in recent years we have had to learn that it is by no means something we can take for granted. Especially the developments in the field of artificial intelligence pose a challenge to democracy. They are blamed for filter bubbles, for fake news, for manipulation, discrimination, and for increasingly efficient surveillance of people, and therefore for the corrosion of fundamental democratic principles. So AI has and it will have a huge impact on our society, and this is the reason why the Goethe Institute is dealing with this topic. My name is Jeanette and I work for the Goethe Institute headquarters in Munich. The Goethe Institute is the worldwide active cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany. We promote the uh, study of the German language abroad and we encourage an international cultural exchange. With our large project Generation A is algorithm, we want to sensitize young adults for AI. We want to present the technical developments in this field and at the same time reflect on them critically. A dialogue between different countries, disciplines and backgrounds is really important for this, for example, with artists and their creative approaches to AI. We believe that the Goethe Institute can establish such a dialogue. And the Couch Lessons, a format of the project Generation A and funded by the Federal Foreign Office, are a very good example for it. Every week, always on Wednesday, we invite AI experts from all over the world to discuss with us and with our audience the risks, the challenges, but also the opportunities presented by the developments in the field of artificial intelligence. With the Couch Lessons, we want to initiate a discussion outside the technology savvy community. We want to question what AI is and what it could and should decide. We also want to ask if there is a way beyond surveillance, disinformation, manipulation and commerce, if AI can do any good as well and can maybe support us to solve big problems like climate change or inequalities. The Couch Lessons are an invitation to learn more about AI, to find meaning behind the technical developments, to inspire new ways of thinking and to create our collective future. But before we start to inspire you again, we want to know what do you, what you think about AI and democracy. And we have prepared a little poll for you. And as long as we wait, I hope you can see it. As long as we wait for the answers, I just want to inform you briefly about some guidelines of our couch lessons. First, our two experts will give an input, each about 15 minutes long. And after that, we will open the discussion. During the whole time, you can ask questions or contribute your opinions in our chat. And I will go through the chat and pick out some of your questions that will be discussed later. I will ask different persons to contribute their questions personally, but if I don't ask you to talk, please turn off your microphone. I also want to want you to know that the entire event is recorded, but we will just record the persons that are speaking. So let's have a look at the results of our poll. Uh, most of you, 70%, uh, think that AI has a negative impact on democracy, but you, yeah, almost 100% of you are thinking that it could be also 
uh, used to have a positive impact on democracy. So we will hear about this in some seconds. And I want to hand over to Martin Turnquist from Sweden, who is my uh, co-curator and who is moderating the whole lesson. Thank you for listening. Yes, thank you, Shanet. Hello, everybody. I'm Martin Tönkvist. As Shanet said, I'm a curator and concept developer based in Malmö in the very south of Sweden. And with us today, we have Linda Monzez and Nathaniel Raymond. They are tuning in from Paris, France and New Haven, the United States. I'm super excited to hear them share the knowledge and experience on today's very important topic, AI and technology. Uh, but before we kick off, please keep doing what you're already doing in the chat, which is to say hello and also typing where you're joining in from. I think it's always a, a nice feeling to see that we are such a an international and global um, uh, group of people in this call today. And it's, it's truly amazing that all of you are here. I see people from Indonesia, the US, Lebanon, Mexico, uh, Belgium, Morocco, Buenos Aires, and so on and so on. Thank you so much, everybody, for, for being here. Um, and in the couch lesson last week, uh, that was about uh, AI and reality, we spoke about how technology that is invented for the entertainment industry and productivity industry are being misused in other fields. We got insights in how massively used deep fakes are, and not only in sort of faking high level politicians, but also sort of mid-level celebrities and, and ordinary people and sort of the problems that that is causing. And today we want to follow that path and take the perspective of uh, AI and democracy or the perspective of democracy. Uh, and we're going to discuss how democracy is being threatened by AI in general and by fake news in particular. And we're also going to talk about how the importance of giving democratic institutions power to govern the design and use of AI technologies. Um, and I was thinking a little bit earlier, and I was thinking about how I, before GDPR, was thinking, how could I ever, as you know, a private person, have anything to say against huge corporations like Facebook or Microsoft? And then with the European Union's data protection regulation from 2018, I understood that, oh, maybe the answer is actually democracy, that my voice do make a difference because it's a small part of the weight behind an institution that has real impact on said companies. So it's needless to say that I'm very excited about the coming 50 minutes uh, and let's get started because we have a lot of things to discuss here today. And our first speaker uh, is both gonna give us a little bit of context sort of reminding us you know, what democracy actually is and then jump into how, in which ways our AI is actually challenging it. And so with us, we have Linda Monzez. Uh, she's a uh, postdoc researcher at Ecole Normale Supérieure's research chair in the geopolit geopolit geopolitics of risk. Uh, and she's the author of Cryptopolitics, Encryption and Democratic Politics in the Digital Era that was released by Rutledge uh, earlier this year. And she also recently published the scientific article, A War Against Truth, Understanding the Fake News Contro Controversy. So please beam your energy and sort of applause and everything to, to Linda Monses. Uh, the screen and microphone is yours. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I think I've never spoke in front of such a truly international crowd, like people from Mexico and Nepal. So I'm really, really excited about uh, being here. Um, let me just share quickly my slides. Um, so we can get started. Yeah, so I'm currently um, in Paris and um, what I want to talk to you about today is first give like a little idea about like what democracy is. Of course, we could talk about hours and days and books have been written about that nonstop. Um, but just to give us a little bit of like the same, get us on the same page. Um, and then I will talk a little bit about what I think in a general sense, the idea between or the relationship between AI and democracy is or could be. And then I will give one example, namely on fake news. As you just heard, that's where I did most of my research over the past year um, as one example. And then I think Nate will uh, continue to give uh, more examples about uh, how AI and democracy are interlinked. Okay, so democracy, what was that again? Um, I think you all heard about it. You learned probably at school about it. Um, so some 
pointers about what democracy is. It's not complete, but usually we assume that democracy relies on some kind of freedom of speech. Um, and in the context of the internet, we usually associate some kind of anonymity, or at least the possibility of anonymity with this, um, because resistance is usually like easier or only possible if we have some kind of uh, anonymity. Um, and with this idea about resistance, we also have this uh, strong idea in democracy um, that we need to protect uh, minorities. Um, this goes hand in hand with the recognition that certain groups are disadvantaged, and I think you will hear later by Nate more to talk, he will talk more about it. Um, and uh, yeah, so individuals uh, who belong to specific um, religious groups or political parties are usually under a certain kind of extra protection in democracies. Um, and we talk when we talk about um, yeah about uh, fake news and later about other examples about healthcare, we will see that this protection of minorities is uh, really crucial. And then we have um, the idea about the public sphere, some kind of media system. Um, and, and usually in demo democracy, we assume that media um, should be free, that there should be some form of critical journalism. Of course, this is very idealistic. We know that there are a lot of problems with, with all these points, but that's what we usually assume um, a functioning democracy uh, relies on. Um, and this public sphere media is then also really important for other aspects of democracy, like elections and voting, because the assumption is that if we have a free uh, media, we can like form a will and form an opinion and utter our resistance against opinions. Um, and this is crucial for democracy. Um, so this is just as a few remarks about like what we talk about when we talk about democracy. Um, so in what ways do I think AI challenges democracy or like is, is maybe in tension with democracy? Um, so I think most of you, if you hear about AI, we have maybe some images from like movies or pop culture um, about this idea that AI might take control. Like this picture on the slide is maybe a bit like um, uh, too much, but this idea that at some point robots will take control. Um, Leaving aside the question if that's realistic, I think this shapes a lot our questions about AI and democracy because we wonder, maybe in democracy, not the people are in control as you know, in democracy should be, but maybe um, the technology is in control or will be in control. Um, and also related to that is uh, maybe a few, just a few companies are in control because um, in reality, only very few actors at the moment are able um, to store and analyze data um, so that we can use big data and then as a consequence, um, artificial intelligence. Um, so it's just very few companies with a specific, very economic interests who are de facto the ones who can work with AI. Um, it's not like I could come up with a startup on AI and uh, just get free access to all of the data actors like Google have that access. Um, and then as a result, it becomes unclear who makes this decision. So if you look back what I just said about um, democracy, um, I think there's a general fear or concern about who is actually in the position to make, um, make the decisions, um, who actually decides about the media, about the public sphere. Um, and also who is in control of these algorithms, but also who is in control of these companies. And I think this is in a most abstract sense, the problem when we talk about AI and democracy. Um, so just to give you one example, I already hinted at it, um, the example of fake news. And I know you probably, since basically the last US election, there has been a uh, constant, um, news about fake news. Um, I know, I'm sure in your specific national context, there were also some kind of debate about fake news. Um, in most countries, it had an impact over the past years um, about elections. There were scandals about it. Um, so um, I'm, I'm sure you, you have some kind of image of what fake news could do. 
Um, so most of the time we um, identify with fake news or we, we define fake news as the intentional spread of wrong stories or falsehoods. So the people who spread it and who write it uh, are usually aware of that it's wrong. So it's not just a mistake by some journalists, but it's intentionally. Um, and so especially um, after the Trump election, after the Brexit referendum, there was a lot of like concern about fake news. And as a solution, or as, like maybe one of the main solutions, um, the question was like, can we maybe develop apps? Can we develop um, like some software who can ad identify fake news and then either delete them or flag them? Um, in, uh, there were a lot of debates about it. Um, we can see at the moment, you know, like probably you know on Twitter, we have these like trusted accounts now. On YouTube, we have flags if, if um, some video or some channel is considered to be harmful or like uh, spreading false news. Um, and all these developments basically started with this concern of fake news. And AI comes in here because AI as a, as a solution um, holds the promise of like identifying fake news based on specific images that are used or specific words patterns um, so to identify what are these fake news um, so this is a bit the link of like how we think maybe ai um, is the solution in the in the poll at the beginning um, a lot of you said like that you also think ai could have a positive effect and i think this is exactly maybe one of these examples people thought about i mean you can maybe tell us later um, but uh, that's probably one of the examples um, ai as a solution to to just screen a lot of data which human beings would be unable to do and identify certain patterns um, and this idea of finding a technological solution is uh, currently debated, for instance, in the context of an EU anti-terrorism law. Um, there's the debate about uh, flagging and deleting actually content that's considered to be terroristic, um, like to support terrorist terrorism. Um, and then also the AI comes in here because the EU suggests that the um, the uh, content is not is not only needs to be deleted when the host knows about it, but it has to be deleted the moment it has been published. So if I was hosting a website, it's not about if someone publishes something illegal at three o'clock in the morning and I, I'm not aware about it, I would still be in the position to have to delete it. And of course, I cannot be in front of the PC 24-7. Um, what would happen? Probably an AI would uh, would work there to delete this content and that AI would also have to um, like of course there would be the danger that this AI maybe deletes things that should not be deleted and here we can see what where the problem starts with democracy or one of the problem because as I said one of the core definitions for democracy is that we have free journalism that we have the possibility to utter a lot of different opinions um, and of course, it's a problem if then an AI starts to decide uh, what kind of content is um, illegal or what kind of content is touristic. Um, and is maybe even programmed in a way that if in doubt, rather delete than rather leave it there. And so we can see here some problems with that. And this is not only, I think that's important to keep in mind, it's not only something in the future or not only something which might happen. Um, at some point, but we can already see that laws in Ukraine or in Malaysia are really um, already um, like put in place in the name of fake, uh, fighting fake news, um, but um, they're really hampering free journalism and, and critical journalism, all in the name of fighting fake news. So I think this is where I think some tension and some problems between AI and the democracy might lie. Um, as a side note, because this is my research and I kind of have to, when I talk about fake news, I have to mention it, um, is that I think uh, a lot of discussions on fake news might actually conflate what's the symptom and what's the cause. So a lot of times I think we consider fake news as the core problem, uh, where I was always think that it might be a symptom of other problems, uh, of problem of a, the media landscape we have, the political economy that's linked to that attention economy. Um, and maybe with the 
general or, or more structural erosion of democratic structures. So this is just a side note, not really about my content, uh, about uh, the topic of AI, but I find it really um, important to point out that I think these are the questions we also have to ask every time we talk about democracy to really think about what's the problem here and uh, what's the solution. And this is actually where I want to end. Um, that I think it hopefully became clear that I think when we think about uh, AI and democracy, the problem might be more with democracy and not so much with the AI. It might be more about the question of who is actually in control of these algorithms, who who can decide uh, what kind of algorithms you use, and who's in the position to actually analyze and store these um, store this data. Um, so maybe the problem might be not really with the algorithm as such, but uh, maybe we should reflect more about the state of democracy. And I think uh, Nate will then follow up with more examples and then Vane. Um, and I will stop here and look really forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Linda. And we'll invite you back at the end for the Q&A. So please keep asking questions uh, in the chat um, and we'll make sure to incorporate them in the discussion after the talks. Um, and now to our next speaker, who is Nathaniel Raymond. He is a lecturer at the JL Jackson Institute for Global Affairs. Uh, his research uh, interests have focused on the human rights and human security implications of communication technologies. And in the coming 15 minutes, he will talk about how democratic societies can design governance structures to install mechanic mechanics for accountability within the realm of AI technologies. So please welcome uh, Nathaniel Raymond. The screen and microphone is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I told Martin and Jeanette that I wasn't going to do slides, but I got inspired by Linda. Um, can you all see this? Yes. Okay. So I don't know if you've seen on Twitter recently the meme, um, how it started and how it's going. Um, I, I saw one of those this morning and I, I thought, um, how did it start with AI and democracy and how is it going? Well, here's how it started, I think. Um, this is the opening of the Epcot Center in 1983, I think, in uh, Walt Disney World in Florida. And you see people with trumpets, you see jazz hands, a lot of balloons, very exciting. So how is it going so far? Um, this is Jurassic Park. Um, the, uh, the dinosaurs uh, appear to have escaped, so to speak, as it relates to uh, AI and democracy. Uh, and I just wanna very quickly, I only have a couple slides here just to really tee up uh, what Martin said, which is uh, how do we think about governing AI in democratic societies? What are the big challenges? Uh, and I'm gonna identify two. What are the big challenges we need to figure out to, to get a saddle on the proverbial horse here, um, or in this case, Tyrannosaurus Rex. Um, what do we mean when we mean democracy? Well, for the purposes of this conversation, I wanna say we've got four core components that we need to think about. Um, democracies involve some form of representation. Um, they involve a compact of rights, which um, recognize certain rights and helps ensure respect for those rights. Um, they allow um, societies to regulate conduct um, by individuals, by organizations. Um, and we do that through a variety of ways, um, most notably laws. And then uh, fourth and finally, they allow recourse um, for individuals and for uh, groups uh, recourse when um, representation is denied and rights are violated. So in the simplest sense, that's your basic anatomy of a democracy. So how does AI work? And we're going to identify these two parts and then stick them together and get to our two challenges we're going to try to figure out here today. Um, so simply, it, what it does, and when we say AI, we often think science fiction, but um, in the simplest sense, what it does is it processes and evaluates different data. And what's data? Data are simply records of a characteristic. 
since the dawn of time, um, as my students, some of whom are on the lecture today and are now rolling their eyes because they've heard me say it 28,000 times, um, since the dawn of time, whether someone was taking a stick and making a mark in mud, or whether we're talking about a supercomputer at CERN, um, all data is, is simply records of a characteristic. Um, and that can be anything. Um, once it has those records of a characteristic that's processing and evaluating, AI systems basically create and manipulate and integrate together indexes of those records of characteristics. Get ready, fancy word alert. It then uses programming called heuristics, in the simplest sense, shortcuts, um, a set of rules to try to make determinations. Notice how I use the word determinations, not decisions. Um, it determines based on those rules, um, certain values, certain uh, probabilities based on the data. Okay, lastly, those determinations can then be used by machines um, and by humans or humans working with machines to make decisions, to make choices. So um, what we are really trying to get to today is with these definitions, two big things. Um, how do you, back to our four R's here, let me see if I can reverse. Um, yeah, so first question, how do you regulate a black box? Meaning that many of these systems are not what we call legible. In other words, we can understand how they work. They are illegible systems. Um, many designers of AI don't even know how they got to results in certain cases. So how do you regulate a black box? And then the second question is, how do you sue a machine? So if we go back to our four R's, the last two, regulate and recourse. And so we're gonna to try to answer this in a second here, but first I'm gonna give you some examples from the United States context um, of where we think AI may have done some harm. So the first is uh, from, and I'm gonna get rid of my screen here. Okay, there we go, hi. Uh, so the first example, um, is from the fall of 2019, from last year. And a study was done by um, a group of doctors, in, including one named Obermeyer, um, that was published in Science about an algorithm called Impact Pro that has been used by the largest healthcare company in the United States, United Healthcare, to make decisions about when patients, and let me give you a number here, 200 million patients, so almost two thirds of the United States, um, need to be referred for a higher standard of care. So a patient has heart disease, they may need a stent, they may need uh, a certain type of pacemaker. This algorithm was, uh, the goal of it was to help the doctor understand where they may need more advanced care. And this algorithm claimed to be colorblind, that it did not see the difference between white Americans and African American, or in the terms of the study, black Americans. Well, it turns out that this algorithm had a calibration bias in it. And what that means um, in uh, plain language is that the way it was making its determination about who needed that advanced care was based on a, a factor of how much money did the individual spend um, on healthcare over the course of the year. And uh, the big problem with it is that African-Americans as a demographic population are sicker than white Americans quantitatively, but they spend less money on healthcare due to what we call social determinants of health. Um, economic factors prevent them from spending as much as white Americans on healthcare. And so what it meant is that African Americans were only referred for a higher standard of care based on that calibration bias about 17% of the time. The authors of the study figured out by building a black box that behaved like this algorithm, 
So it's proprietary. They couldn't get the algorithm. They recreated it um, in their lab. And what they found is that actually that number should have been 45% of the time the African-American population was referred to higher care. Wow. Wow. So we talk about AI and harm in society, often hypothetically. This is not hypothetical. We can very safely say that this algorithm, which included 200 million Americans in it, um, contributed in some way, potentially to an increase, a, a likely increase in the mortality uh, and morbidity of African Americans in the United States. That is a clear example of harm. And so the question is, um, and you'll see in a second, I'll give you another piece of information. The question here of, okay, how do we regulate this black box <laughs> and how do we sue a machine? This question also is now no longer hypothetical because about a month after this study came out, the Attorney General of the State of New York launched an investigation of United Healthcare and the sub-company Optum um, in terms of this uh, racial disparity in who is getting a higher standard of care. So that investigation is ongoing. There's a potential that this could be one of the first moments that charges are brought against a company for an algorithm. And the big issue here is that this type of harm that we see in the case of the United Healthcare study is called exclusion. Okay, it is it ex excluded a group from a certain type of outcome. And let's go back to our first two R's. <laughs> well, that's not representative. <laughs> One group has been represented more than another. Additionally, it has violated rights. So let's talk in terms of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. What rights has this violated? Well, there's a right to health, right? To a minimum standard of healthcare. There is a right to life, liberty, and security of person. <laughs> you could claim it may be violated that. And also, it violated, this is very wonky, but bear with me. I think it's Article 13, which is um, the right to share in scientific advancement and all its benefits. So just looking at this one incident, we see through this harm of exclusion that um, several rights have likely been violated and the rep representation of a group within the imagination of this machine has affected their representation um, in core service provision. So I'm gonna give you one other example and Martin, how am I doing on time here? Uh, good question. You have at least five minutes. Perfect. So that's one harm. Now I'm gonna um, lay out a quick um, uh, example of another harm. And unfortunately in the past 24 hours, uh, this example has become very relevant in the United States which is, um, if you've got your camera on, how many of you have heard of Palantir? Worst named company ever, as you all know, the Palantir, if you're dorks like me, the Palantir is the all-seeing um, stones used by Sauron in uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings, um, and they corrupt those who look into them and turn them evil. Uh, Palantir, is a company that just went public this month, and it is a data analytics and artificial intelligence firm that equips governments and other organizations, including companies, with analytic packages. One of those um, organizations was ICE, um, which is our Immigration um, and Customs Enforcement Agency here in the United States. Under the Trump administration, as many of you know, there was a process called zero tolerance where children were separated from parents and put in cages along the border. We learned um, from the American Civil Liberties Union as part of their uh, court case um, uh, contesting this practice and seeking recourse. Once again, one of our R's. Um, the ACLU says that uh, 574, I believe is the number um, of the parents of these children 
cannot be found to reunite the uh, children with them. And then flip it around, over 300 children that were separated cannot be found. Um, okay, what does this have to do with artificial intelligence? Well, we know, um, and part of this is anecdotal, and we're gonna need uh, significantly more congressional investigation to find out more, something called a individual case management system or ICS was being used um, in at least one incident in uh, Mississippi in the fall, uh, late August, early September of 2019, where uh, this data appears to have been used in a raid at a Mississippi chicken processing plant to target undocumented immigrants. And uh, it had a high rate of false positives. And that meant it targeted people for deport deportation who were here legally. During the time, about 24, 72 hours, give or take, that these people were held in a detention facility, it was about to be the start of the school year in Mississippi. And no uh, plan was made for the fact that the kids, in some cases, were left home alone, and no one was there to take them to school for the start of the school year. Um, I use this as an example because we are seeing increasing evidence that Palantir in this incident case management system has been fusing together through something called the mosaic effect, multiple indexes of data. Indexes of data that under the Obama administration were not allowed to be connected together, such as driver's license information from states such as South Dakota, I believe. Um, that data had been walled off. Additionally, there was something called the 1974 Privacy Act, which meant that the fair information practice principles are closest equivalent of your GDPR. Um, under the Trump administration were found to no longer apply to uh, those who were here legally. <laughs> under the Obama administration, those data protection principles applied. And so what we're left with here is we have a targeting system that has been used by an agency that has been separating parents from their children, that has had a high rate of false positives, using indexes that we don't know what all of them are, and they have been clearly making decisions based on the determinations of the system. So one case we saw with United Healthcare, how AI in a democratic society can exclude people from services. Here with ICS and Palantir, we see how it can create a group that targets people for, in, in this case, because of the system um, and also because of the policy, different types of harms. And so the question we wanna really get to is what does regulation of these two types of harms have to look like? What do those laws need to do? And very quickly, we need to begin to create, um, and my students are now gonna roll their eyes, a definition of what constitutes, fancy term, duty of care. Who has the legal responsibility to make sure that these systems are, quote, street legal, are not negligent in their deployment? When we figure that out, we have to develop metrics and quality criteria like we do with the Environmental Protection Agency to prevent pollution. Similarly, we have to do that with AI. What data can be used? What data cannot be used? What scenarios is it inappropriate because of the vulnerability of populations for AI to be deployed at all, especially where it can exacerbate or create certain types of racial or demographic bias? And then the big question that we can't answer, but will be answered soon, I believe, especially when we look at United Healthcare is how do we sue a machine? Um, do we sue the designer? In many cases, back to Linda's point, there's over 3,000 uh, AI companies in the United States, give or take. The majority of the market share is controlled by about six. And those are the usual suspects, Google, AI, IBM. Um, often these pieces of AI are repurposed in multiple other systems. What's the chain of custody to prove that one system was the thing that did harm? Do we sue the designer? Do we sue the company? Do we sue the people who decided to use it in a context? 
In this case, will we sue ICE? Will we sue Donald Trump? These questions have not been resolved. But what I wanna leave you with is this, back to the first two R's. How we figure out recourse and regulation will determine the future of representation and of rights. That's the stakes. So back to our poll, <laughs> do you think AI is a has a negative impact on democracy? Majority says yes. Do you think that AI could have a positive impact on democracy? Majority says yes. What will determine that future potential positive impact is not technology. Or you could argue in a way it is technology, but not a ones and zeros technology. Ethics is a technology. Law is a technology. To end, to quote Ursula Franklin, to paraphrase the great Ursula Franklin, um, who said, technology is the way you do anything. So the question is, how are we going to do AI with these other technologies now being brought into the picture? And that's law, that's ethics. You guys are gonna answer that question. Back to you. Thank you, Nathaniel. Uh, good question. And I'm also, before I'm uh, asking uh, Jeanette to, to take more questions from the audience, I'm super curious to, to hear, I mean, we have two speakers from the academic community here, uh, and you also sort of pointed to us that some of the you know drivers for this change, but I, I'm curious to see both from you, Linda, hear from you, Linda, and, and you're from you, Nathaniel, what sort of signs do you see so outside of the tech companies and maybe not in the academic circles, who are driving these changes, sort of the positive use of uh, AI for, for, for the sake of democracy, but also in, in what you're talking about now, Nathaniel, in, in sort of ways to, to, to better govern um, AI. I mean, are there any like institutions or companies or persons that we should sort of look to for, for sort of seeing some good, good signs of positive uh, change here? Who wants to go first? You're unmuted, so go ahead. Okay. Uh, well, here in the United States, we where we're seeing change is at the municipal level. And so uh, in the past year, it's not been the federal government, um, less so states. It's really been um, cities, Portland, San Francisco, um, LA, who have engaged in either referendums on the prohibition of certain types of predictive policing or facial recognition systems, or there have been court cases that have um, uh, encouraged or outright prevented certain police departments um, or municipalities from using certain systems. Um, as Rashida Richardson uh, in her article um, about dirty data and bad decisions in predictive policing notes in her case study on New Orleans, um, is that New Orleans was using Palantir and because of the lack of transparency in the system and the contracting process, they chose to stop using it, I believe in 2018. So what we're really seeing on the United States side where there is cause for hope is people are putting it on the ballot. They are making it a local issue. And so that's where the question is on the two R's, Will we have court cases challenge those local uh, decisions that take them up to a national level here in the United States? And I think there's been similar precedents in Germany and uh, elsewhere in the European Union. Or are we gonna look at legislatures acting proactively and saying, okay, we can't have a bunch of different local standards, we'll create a national one. There's currently a proposal within Congress, a bill to create a national moratorium on the use of AI and predictive policing. We'll see if in the next Congress that goes up. Um, yeah, so um, I think most people in Germany will probably have heard about the Cars Computer Club, maybe Netzpiloten, like, you know, like organizations who really um, like go to law, uh, go to court and really um, sue companies. Um, but I think also uh, we can see it on the European level, at least some initiatives. Um, I know there's a lot of critique about the GDPR and it's not perfect, but I think it shows at least that it's possible to change something because I think um, these companies have been really successful in establishing a narrative where their power is so 
big that we can't do anything against it anyway and kind of fatalism so i would just encourage everyone who is like mildly interested uh, just not to give them that fatalism but really understand that that's like a political struggle and it's it's not decided yet um what kind of future there will be um so i think that's important to keep in mind great thank you so uh to to be a little bit more political and and to sort of uh float our voices is is is, is one way to go about it i'm going to hand over to to Shanet, who will bring in some some questions from from the participants as well thank you very much Yes, there's a very lively discussion in our chat and we have some questions or thoughts about the big tech companies and I would start with a question from Anisha Yoshi, maybe you want to unmute yourself. Um, hi, so uh, my question like I sort of got this just based on the antitrust hearings that took place in the US recently about just like the monopoly that these big tech companies like Google and Microsoft and Apple had like just on the technology market. But then just like when you broaden the scope of that to a more global nature, we can also see how these companies have a very hegemonic status in basically countries all over the world, but then they don't necessarily have any responsibility towards like having a good media space in a country like I come from Nepal, but then if Facebook does anything or like if people are using Facebook to do something that um, interferes with democratic processes, like the company itself does not have any liability to do anything about that. So like my question is basically, what are some possible strategies that we can use to prevent this kind of media like monopoly and also increase their responsibilities in not skewing the media spaces and democracies of countries like that seem pretty insignificant but then like still these media companies have a very big bearing on like the media spaces of these countries thank you so who wants to answer this I can I can do it. So, sorry I wasn't sure if we take only one question or so more yes um yeah so uh thanks for bringing that up because I think a lot of times the discussions we have are very focused on a few countries so the first part of Mansa will be very academic but I really think that we also need more knowledge um if you look at like what kind of research is produced then um it is very focused on European Union um or like the West in general with the US. Um, so, sorry, I think that's probably will not satisfy you. Um, I know about some um, grassroots movements, um, especially when it's about like educating, for instance, a dissident voice, dissidents and journalists about protecting of their data. Um, because at the moment I find it like on a political level, um, especially um, like it is difficult as you could see the EU struggles to control anything. And if you're then in states with maybe um, less democratic like, institutions or like, I don't know, it, it might be even more difficult. Um, so I know personally of like uh, technical, technical tech, uh, for instance, they, they do more grassroots movements to educate people, to, to make journalists aware of how to protect their data, the importance of encryption and all these things. Um, so I think at the moment, unfortunately, that's the level where one has to start, but I think it's also important to, to keep the pressure on. Um, and it's, I think so far it's unclear what the impact of the GDPR to other countries is, and if it's only good or bad, I mean, it's probably mixed. Um, but, um, yeah, I think it's also, it's one of the main political challenges, how to control, um, a company that works on a global level with national parliaments. Um, yeah, so I don't, unfortunately, I don't have a really good solution for that. <laughs> Thank you. So I would like to hand over to Christian Bissinger. He has a lot of questions and one is also regarding the big tech companies. Maybe you want to take over? 
Yeah, it was it was a question in general about um, yeah the issue that uh, as a customer you uh, you can use big social media platforms as a Facebook within um, yeah Instagram and others for free and these big tech companies they are making their money with um, selling our personal data. So my question was um, if there might be a solution. Uh, within uh, the um, regulator um, could um, introduce um, a regulation where uh, these tech companies uh, should uh, let the choice to um, customers whether they are willing to, to give up their information and more precisely also in the context of uh, the US elections. Um, where social media is also playing a very um, yeah, important role. Um, role if um, this regulation could protect um, yeah, social media from um, yeah, manipulating um, voters um, into certain patterns. Thank you. Well, that, that's the $20 trillion question, uh, Christian. I, I think um, going back to the, the question that was just posed and, and building off of uh, what Linda said that, you know, um, it's a question of theory of change. And the, the thing that really worries me about the current antitrust movement in the United States is that I don't think it will solve the problem it's trying to fix. It's like doing a heart transplant when we really need to have chemo for cancer. Um, and uh, what I mean by that is that we, we are, we're looking, we have two problems that have conjoined together. One is the power and the unique access um, to data and to markets that these companies have. The second is the data structure and the virality model itself. So I want to pull these apart in terms of your question on the, the issue of paying um, with data. Uh, right now, uh, a lot of the harms we're seeing in terms of misinformation in elections is about, uh, are about uh, foreign actors uh, in the U.S. context figuring out how to juke the algorithm, trick the algorithm, and, and drive the movement of narratives in a way that is uh, encouraging division. So I want you to imagine a network graph, and I'm taking from the work of uh, my colleague Kate Starbird at the University of Washington, Seattle. She found that social media interference, so if we see two big plumes here in the Black Lives Matter movement from uh, a couple summers ago before the most recent uh, BLM protests, you would see in those who are anti-BLM on one side, a big blue cloud with a red heat map in the middle, and those who are pro Black Lives Matter messages on the other side, and very little connection, the connection being pulled apart between them. And in the middle of each of these blue clouds are these red heat maps. And those were narratives planted by uh, the GRU and the uh, IRA, the not the Irish Republican Army, but the Internet Research Agency um, of Vladimir Putin's government. Um, officers uh, in the GRU were uh, charged just this week um, with cyber attacks and cyber operations uh, by the US Department of Justice. Why these heat maps are important, Christian, is that the point here is not to convince people to vote a certain way. It is to cause division and to prevent consensus and agreement. And so the, the question here is in terms of this threat of disinformation and its corrosive effect on the most sacred part of a democracy, which is its electoral processes, does on one hand paying, uh, creating a different business model, um, change the virality algorithm that has been manipulated to cause division? I don't know, but we got to figure that out. The second thing, does antitrust, breaking up these companies, change the incentive to use an ADU, an active daily user virality-based advertising model? I don't know. But the issue here is that it's not about swinging votes in the election per se. 
this activity is about creating conflict within societies to prevent consensus on agendas. Thank you very much. There are also some questions and discussions about AI that is delating the wrong content. Maybe Alexander Heinel, do you want to ask your question? Oh, yeah, I was um, looking at a recent report uh, in which there was a complaint um, that AI and Facebook would delete a lot of the content before human uh, watchers see it or observers see it. And part of this content, like violent or criminal uh, actions, and part of it, um, they said they were normally using to identify war criminals. And now they were asking that Facebook should keep all of these data and have people reviewing it so that later it can be used for, um, I think this was the Human Rights Court, um, that they can use these data later to reconstruct uh, people that were involved in human rights, um, human rights violations. And I was reading this and thinking like now, okay, so what should they really do at Facebook? Should they now try to delete and use AI to prevent this to become viral and become spread across their users? Or is this rather something they should not do? So I am directly engaged in these discussions, negotiations right now. So there's uh, on this question of um, retention of evidence for war crimes prosecution. I'm a war crimes investigator before I became a quasi-academic. Um, I've spent my career investigating war crimes and working with organizations like the United Nations and the International Criminal Court on these issues, including doing open source investigations, uh, including the Satellite Sentinel Project with George Clooney at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative. And so we dealt with these issues of content removal. Um, it, it's, it's, a, it's a big question. The issue that came up that uh, compelled the creation of the report you're talking about by Human Rights Watch, uh, video not found, um, I believe, I, I keep screwing up the title. Um, you should read it, it's great. Um, the uh, Human Rights Watch report is talking about a recent issue where Gambia brought a case against Myanmar for use of social media in the alleged 2017 genocide against the Rohingya to incite genocide. And Gambia sought um, justice for that in the International Court of Justice. And Facebook denied Gambia's request for metadata, so data about uh, network function, and for actual content related um, to, they said, liability under the Stored Communications Act um, and other aspects of US law. Um, the, the solution to this, both in the US context and in the European context, is about creating statutory, so legal requirements for retention and sharing with exemption for liability for these companies. Now, Twitter and others have asked for a good Samaritan protection to be able to share this type of information. Um, this will have to be figured out by legislatures. I think it's going to happen pretty soon. I think there's going to begin to be an emerging standard within the next year to 18 months um, about how we balance individual privacy and the issue of civil society, human rights investigations, open source investigations. But it's going to have to happen through law. Um, end user license agreements called EULA deal with this in some cases, such as on election interference research, but it is not coherent and comprehensive enough for the broader issue of human rights abuses. Oh. So I hope there's time for one more question. I would hand over the microphone to Vera Kadam. I hope I pronounce it right. So the microphone is yours. Vira, it was a question about surveillance. Maybe you can ask it personally. Uh, 
or I just uh, read it from the chat. Uh, she asked us, will the concept of surveillance state become a uh, imposing reality in the future with application of AI? Okay, I guess it's my turn. <laughs> um, well, I think that's always interesting because I think a lot of times we are very, uh, and our ideas very much shaped by pop culture. But on the other hand, I think we always assume it will be in the future and not now, and we kind of forget about how much is actually happening already. Um, CCTV, how much credit card, I mean, how much is actually already happening. Um, I think as both our talks already showed a bit is that we kind of think that the problem will be more a triangle or like maybe a triangle between citizen state and companies. Um, so it might not be the surveillance state, but it will be a surveillance state company nexus. Hi. Hi. Um, sorry, I just see some children. I'm not sure if everyone sees it. Um, and um, yeah, so I think maybe it will be not a surveillance state, but more a conglomeration of different agents and different practices. I also think it will not be maybe like one state that like one data bank, but more um, a combination of many practices and maybe, maybe many data banks that might then merge, but I think it's it's not like one uh, static thing, as I think some previous science fiction maybe has imagined. I hope that helps. Nathaniel, you also want to answer or? Well, I would just say that um, I think Linda's absolutely right. I, I think, you know, the, the issue we're already seeing if we look at what's happened in Hong Kong within the past year is that we have um, uh, this moment with the protests in Hong Kong where we see these counter, what I call counter legibility actions, the use of umbrellas, the use of other countermeasures, laser pointers to attempt to confound artificial intelligence systems. And we've seen both in the, the protests in uh, Sudan, protests happening in Nigeria, the way that internet, sensors, AI, this matrix of legibility, this net of legibility um, is something increasingly that democratic movements are trying to um, overwhelm, um, counteract and use to their advantage. Um, this paradigm of leaving democratic movements um, basically to fight for themselves against these surveillance nets is really a, 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 a indictment, not just on the dictators that use them, but on the Western societies that have, uh, that are democracies, supposedly the democracies of the capital D that have yet to create a clear policy and a unified policy between the United States, the European Union, and elsewhere to, to say what we think um, and what consequences will happen for the use of surveillance systems, some of which are from our countries, um, to repress democratic movements elsewhere. Uh, I think this is the human rights issue of our time. It is the foreign policy and national security issue of our time. Um, how much do we care about other people's right to have rights? <laughs> um, increasingly, our um, position on the exportation and deployment of these sensor and decision support technologies will determine uh, uh, how much we actually care about the freedoms uh, we enjoy or claim to enjoy in our countries uh, whether we believe they should be available to others in the digital age. <clears throat> Thank you, Nathaniel. So go figure that out, guys. Um, maybe I end with a comment here in the chat uh, because uh, Alicia Cogdomes, I hope I pronounced it right, and right uh, came back to a uh, sentence from from linda uh, was mentioned way before that maybe we should discuss more about our understanding of democracy than ai but i think i hope we could also show you with this lesson the impact of ai on democracy and i want to thank linda nathaniel martin my colleagues and all of you 
and I would like to draw your attention to our upcoming couch lesson about AI and economy. Next Wednesday, we will speak about the impact of AI on the gap between rich and poor. And I hope you will join us again. We are also planning a December edition with four new couch lessons and make sure you keep yourself informed. You find all information about the upcoming couch lessons as well as the videos from the past couch lessons on our website, goethe.de slash couch lessons. I hope you have enjoyed our today's lesson and I hope that we see you again. Thank you very much.